If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe. Special thank you to Landmark Coffee Roasters, a sponsor for this podcast. If you haven't tasted their coffee, you've got to go check it out. Some of the best beans in Southern California, landmarkroasters.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Fredo Ramos in the Stoke House. <laughs> Fredo, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I'm excited to be here. Fredo, you are pastor at Sandals mm-hmm. Church in Riverside, California with Matt Brown. Yeah. You have a bachelor's in philosophy, is that right? Yeah. And is it MDiv or master's in MDiv. theology? M- MDiv. And this man did his homework. Look at him. Uh, the brothers would say about Fredo that you are brilliant and wow. you are the thoughtful one. You love people well. You are the stoic, contemplative. You think deeply about life, the word of God and people. You also love to party and go big <laughs> on fun. Uh, you helped us plant Legacy nine years ago here in LA. Yeah. You're a major part in helping launch our church and encourage us to take the risk in LA. Yeah. Uh, many don't know, but you are a true baller. Like you can dominate in the paint if you want to. Uh, you and Donnie would crush the floor. We call you guys the Twin Towers. Oh, yeah. Okay? Uh, your sneaker game is off the charts, and I wish you would Thank impart you. like one ounce of that to me. Thank you. Um, at the same time, you'll never pass up a good book, the opportunity true. to soak in uh, some literature. You're consuming books often. Many don't know, but you are a Star Wars Jedi and a Lakers fanatic. Shout out to King James and Yoda if you're listening. Uh, Lakers, if you want to sponsor the podcast, we're ready. We prefer oh, court, courtside tickets, please. Uh, you love your wife, Ashley, and your kids well. Yeah. Shout out to Ashley. Fredo, brother, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Thank you. What an introduction. My goodness. I, uh, it's really true. It's actually all true. Thank you, man. Uh, just like many of the brothers we met like, is like 20 years ago or something, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. I think I remember, I don't know if it was the single moment, but I remember meeting you on the left side of the Sanctuary of Harvest. Bro, I had that exact thought. Serious? This morning driving out here. I was recounting like, when did I first meet Josh? And it was around the corner. I'm pretty sure on a Sunday night after day seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you approached Donovan and I, and you said, I've heard about you guys. (laughs) I've heard about hey, it. I think yeah. you had your beard still. Yeah. And, you know, you were probably like in this brown jacket you used to wear with yes. like four Bibles. I don't know why you would carry four Bibles with hey, you. I was, trying, I was trying to look holy, baby. You had a bunch of Bibles or a so bunch of books. It was leveling up. But you, uh, dude, you had a good word for us. Uh, and I actually used it in a message recently. Really? Yeah. You had said, because we were sharing with you like, yo, we just had this recent conversion, you know, and you had this line about, like you've had a, you've had an encounter with Jesus, but now you have to learn to like live with him, mm. like continue to follow him. You mm. know, like it was a, it was a really profound moment that I remember, but mm. we were for sure on like the left corner yeah. of that massive sanctuary, you know, one night. And uh, I think, yeah, ever since then it was a wrap, man. We used to hang out all the time after that. So. I can remember the orange filter coming from that light in the parking. <laughs> at, like it, it was a, it was a night uh, parking lot light that sat on the side of the building or something. And it yeah. would, it would put this filter on everything on that left side of the building. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I was walking up there, what was happening, but all of a sudden there's Donnie and Fredo and you can't miss them because these dudes are like towers. I mean, they're just towering over everybody. Yeah. And I had heard a bunch about uh, the ministry that you guys were doing uh, with the high school ministry. I kept hearing you guys' names everywhere. Yeah. And uh, you guys were running with Steve, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because at that time, that had to be 2007. And I came to faith that April, like right after some, some event, something happened. It was like shortly after Easter. Donovan and Roxanne were already going to harvest, and mm. then their younger uh, Rox's younger sister Ashley, who then you mm-hmm. know was someone that I mm-hmm. took interest in mm-hmm. years after, mm-hmm. uh, were all going to church, and then they they you know they eventually dragged me along. So I remember texting Don one night like, "Yo, what are you what are you doing, man?" I was at home literally like just binge watching The Sopranos. Nice, <laughs> you know, as a young adult with like a part time job yes. trying to make it through college would be doing, and I was just like bored. Like, what are you doing? He's like, "Oh, I'm I'm going to church actually." I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. And they say, you want to come? I'm like, all right, I guess, you know. So Donnie was going to Harvest? Yeah, yeah, he was. So we were all playing in the Harvest Basketball League. Oh. But he was going. Got it. Um, regularly attending with Rocks. Was this he, Repent? 
Yeah, this is a team repent, <laughs> which is like an ironic team name, given that none of us were actually like living in repentance. But That's good. We, we were we were playing for team repent. So because we just wanted to hoop, you know, yeah. so like I obviously knew of the church. Um, my parents would go there because we had some friends that were there through the school I was at at the time or years before that. But yeah, so my first connection was through high school ministry with Steve. Mm hmm. And, um, and then we, you know, we saw what you were doing, I think with college and career before it was even called the well, mm. it was college and career. Mm -hmm. And then you had helped, I think Mike Jonker at the time, like kind of mm -hmm. revamp it a little bit. Cause Fridays we used to go out and do street witnessing. Yes. Cause once I became a Christian, I just That's married, right. I just married the church. That's right. Like, I just didn't know what else to do. So I just did basics class Mondays, mm. um, your Bible study Tuesdays, eventually That's Wednesday right. was youth. And then like. Friday was, uh, yeah, we would go street witnessing and then the, the weekend was service. So mm. yeah, every day we'd be doing something. But I think shortly after that encounter with you, probably started to make the change from like street witnessing to attending the, the Friday night gathering at the time. The Wasn't well. that crazy, so, all that street witnessing that was going on? Yeah, yeah. Like Monday, nice. Friday, Saturday night, it was so like much, nonstop. Man. All these young kids just going out, movie theaters, the mall, yeah. and just walking up to people. Yeah, I it mean, the Tyler Mall, the Plaza. Just radical and foolish, man. Just going yeah. for it. Just swinging for the fences. <laughs> uh, we just walk up people Dave, and just be like, um, do you know where you're going to go when you die? Yeah. And I just feel like people are like, what? <laughs> like, Which what is like, who wants to hear that when they walk out of Abercrombie and Fitch? Right, like a right. Pair of jeans. Like, I'm kind of excited about these clothes yeah, right now. I just... No, it was a hundred dollars on jeans. I'm not, I don't want to think about death yet. It's interesting to, yeah, to reflect on that and just think like what people thought, you know, of like, and I don't know, you know, by God's grace, you know, there were some divine appointments would show up from time to time. Oh yeah. Cool stuff would happen. But yeah, uh, we, that started us on a path of real radical, um, yeah, radical faith, radical ministry, taking steps of faith to, to see and ask God do great things amongst these young brothers. Yeah. I think at that time we were probably on the tail end of just that movement as a whole when that when that kind of form of evangelism still somewhat made sense for people. Mm. Like when you in other words when you said the word Jesus, mm. people still had a kind of category for that, or right. God or sin, you right. know. Now a lot of that mental furniture is very much like different or it's right. just gone and so like evangelism looks a, a little bit more relational I think and right. kind of drawn out, you know, in healthy ways, but yeah, I think we were still in that in that kind of tail end of yeah. of life where like that kind of street witnessing was maybe like people came to expect it. Like if you're going right. to be at the mall on a Friday night, right. someone's probably going to come up and hand you a track. Totally, you know, we got the J Dubs over there. We yeah. got, we got <laughs> the LDS over there. We got the Christians. Yeah, yeah. Especially in Riverside, yeah. And there, there's some type of foundation laid in that city in which mm -hmm. yeah, you say the name of Jesus, people aren't just going to off you, right? Um, right. You know, in this city. Yeah, uh, they're definitely not. <laughs> yeah, you know? it's going to be a and, bit different, I bet, out here. Yeah, and um, they see a Bible in your hand, you know, they think street preacher and all of the rest. And so, yeah, yeah, definitely um, culture has changed, a lot has changed. And, yeah. Uh, but that was a, yeah, that was a sweet time. That was a really beautiful time. Did you grow up solely in Riverside? Yeah, born and raised my whole life. Wow. Uh, my parents lived here, and uh, my dad was originally from Corona, so mm -hmm. he's a little little Mexican from Corona. Nice. <laughs> I say little, I mean, he's 5'10". Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, he, so he was born and raised in Corona. My mom, born and raised in Riverside, she only moved away to Oxnard for a little bit of her life, and mm -hmm. then came back. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Riverside native. And then Arlington High School, um, Woodcrest. 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 Yeah. So yes. I was one of those rare kids that went to a private school. Yes. But never really like followed Jesus throughout that entire time. Uh, and so, but it was very much like memorizing verses, you know, very familiar with like Christian truth and belief. But I think, man, at that time, the gospel that I still loved and believed in was just do what you need to do to enjoy the life you want to have. Like mm -hmm. that was essentially, as I look back and think about, especially like my high school life. Like that was the good news I believed in. Do what I need to do to do what I want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So like work in the way that I need to so that on the weekends I can do what I want, mm -hmm. which is, you know, have a good time, mm -hmm. pursue pleasure. And so that was primarily my identity for so long, you know? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until, yeah, 21 in, in college at UCR where all of that just kind of collapsed mm -hmm. and it felt like, this is such a small view of life, mm. you know, and it seems like my soul was made for so much more than just that. And mm. so, and then through friendships, Donovan, other people, um, 
my own crisis. I had took a philosophy class and the professor, Peter Graham, it was, the class was called like reason, belief, and truth. Mm. And we read the last day of Socrates. We read some of Plato's work and uh, I didn't know it at the time, but he was a believer, mm. but like he was just asking just very big questions. And I realized like, dang, these are the same questions I remember hearing going to this school. Like I was at this private school my whole life and never mm. followed Jesus. And so I started to realize like, dang, I think, I think the Bible actually has some answers to some of these questions, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't think they're, they're answers that we can just like dismiss so easily. And so, and then I had my own kind of personal crisis, I think of just like feeling low in life and then mm -hmm. realizing why was I so low? I had friends, I had a good life, I had a job, you know, and so it was hard. Like, it was just like this existential crisis, you mm -hmm. know? So listening to Johnny Cash going home, hurt myself today, you know, really? like, yeah, just feeling like, man, what's like, just feeling like the weight of the world as a yeah. young 21 year old, yeah. but not able to make sense. Why would I feel like this, right. you know? Right. And so again, yeah, through relationships and friends and like, um, Jesus was just reckless in, in the way that he hunted me down and then mm -hmm. made my way to harvest. Mm -hmm. So, Did you, um, was there a, was there a single Jesus moment for you or was it a, was it a, a month of time or two months of time phase? Yeah, it was definitely a Sunday night. Um, Steve Wilburn was preaching. I no can't way. tell you what Steve was preaching on, Yeah, but I just remember going home, feeling some kind of way about it. And I went into my room. I had lo had a love sack at the time. Nice. <laughs> that Jason Martin eventually Shout out love, love sack. <laughs> yeah, love Shout sack. out to Jay and love sack. <laughs> yeah, dude. But I remember sitting on that oh, love sack, that. just sinking into it. Yeah. And like for the first time, feeling two things, both like the weight of my sin, but then also the immense just love of God and mm. his presence in a way that I didn't know how to describe. Like it was such a weird experience. But then in that moment, I like genuinely prayed like a prayer of repentance, like, mm. God, forgive me. I want to follow you. And, so, and then something happened, man. Mm. Like something happened. I went to sleep. I woke up, felt the same, but felt different at the same moment, you know. Mm. And then I just started reading scripture like crazy. And then I felt like the Lord just brought back so much that I had learned at school, mm. going to a private school, mm -hmm. and just started to bring it back, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I dug up old Bibles uh, that I had written a lot of answers in for mm. Bible tests. So mm -hmm. it was just, uh, yeah, it was just a flooding of like things that I had learned from years ago now mm. were just starting to come back in a different kind of way, you know? And so there was just a, a revitalization of my life at that moment, you mm. know? So, yeah, it was When huge. you reflect on your um, your education, and your schooling and your childhood. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Were there things that pushed you away from Christ within the school? What are things that you're thankful for? Like when you reflect on the whole experience? Oh gosh. Yeah. That's such a good question, man. Cause it's kind of both. And, huh. you know, like you're grateful for teachers who were doing what they like were called to do, which right. is like both to give you an education but then also to give you like Christian truth, give you scripture, give you the gospel. You know, what you're ungrateful for is like, they didn't live up to that standard, mm. right? And that's kind of the challenge, I think, for any institution that's mm. like trying to be religious is like, you you don't quite live up to the ideal that you're offering, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. And so I liken it to being in a hospital, like you go to a hospital to get well, but then if you stay there long enough, you pick up the, the diseases that are in that hospital, right. you know what I mean? And so, that's sometimes what it was like being at a private Christian school it was like, there was a lot of things in there designed to help get you well and get you healthy. But then at the same time, the longer you stayed in there, the more you picked up its, its own subculture, mm. you know? And mm -hmm. I think some of that, if it's not understood well, can push you further away from Jesus, mm -hmm. you know? And I say that as someone who still loves and appreciates like Christian education, yes. you know, my kids are at a Christian, they're at that Christian school are they right really? now. They're yeah. Woodcrest? Yeah, Eli oh, and Ella are awesome. at Woodcrest Christian Elementary. So wow. I very much, am, I, I look back and I'm grateful for my time there. I wouldn't have like said, oh, send me somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know, but it just, yeah, I think as I try to understand why wasn't I a believer beforehand, I think it was just because a lot of different things, mm. you know, but mainly my own heart just wanted what I wanted, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it wasn't until God and his timing, you know, tracked me down at 21, so. And then did you, uh, did you enter basketball at Woodcrest? Did you play? Yeah, yeah, I played in high school. That's the, the length of my career. Yeah. <laughs> no college career. Yeah, yeah. No pro career, but. Uh, you guys did win some championships though over at the Harvest Tournaments. We did, you know, yeah, yeah we have some. You got some rings. We have some men's leagues championships <laughs> to take pride in. Yeah. 
but uh yeah still love the hoop man so yeah and i'm grateful for it because like sports was like something god used for sure you know like it gave us connections to people who were like godly men mm -hmm. you know and so before we even realized that we needed it like they were in our lives you mm -hmm. know mainly because we wanted to hoop but they mm -hmm. wanted to hoop and also disciple you mm -hmm. know so yeah, that was that was crucial for us. I played for Dulos with uh, Aaron. Yeah, and, Dulos. Uh, Aaron was a coach. Fierce rivalries, uh, man. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, battles. We had Houston on the team, and he was dunking. You know, like, and I I wanted to I I, I always tell people that I dunk, but I actually never dunked my whole life. <laughs> like I'm a dunk on you, you know, and I. I'd show up in these flashy Pumas. You know, the guys are like mocking me for them. You know, it's hilarious. <laughs> And, uh, I, you know, one of the things that I learned the most though from that experience was I couldn't believe how, how much in the flesh I would get, how competitive I was oh, and how yeah. like, I would just be, you know, we're here, we're praying before the game. We're like reading the word. We're like doing a little Bible study. We're like getting all ready. And then in the middle of the game, I'd be so angry, yeah. like at myself, at my teammates, at every, I'd be like the, you know, the referee, I'd just be like, they missed the call. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like we're supposed to be these godly guys, like playing on the court. And here I am. Yeah. Anyways, it was a it was a, a great revealer of the heart. Like I oh for sure. I had to like step back from competition, like in a lot of my early years, because I knew like I would just get so in the flesh. I mean, it was crazy how much it revealed that. Oh yeah, yeah. Sports has a way of bringing things out, man. Yeah, it'll, it'll just show you what's inside. So right. It's humbling. It's exciting because that one thing like sports can elevate. Your, your passion, your game, all that stuff. But then it'll also expose a lot of things. So Yeah, yeah. And church league sometimes tend to be the worst. Oh, it's hilarious. <laughs> Pastor's out there playing. You know, he's like shouting the guy down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, um, so, we, so we go from, yeah, high school ministry and all of that into the well, the college ministry launches, yeah. and all these young people show up out of nowhere. You're at UCR. Mm-hmm. Um, we start Bible clubs on those campuses. Yeah. Um, this crew of brothers show up. I don't yeah. know how this thing happens, but it's like this brotherhood starts to form. And I don't know, I liken that season to, um, it was like a sharpening time. Oh, for sure. It was for like, sure. we were sharpening each other like every single day. Like yeah. we always had something to debate, always had something to talk through, always had something. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a, like a, it, it was like a non-formal seminary. Of yeah, times. no, it really was, man. It was like a, some kind of like school in the wilderness where we just came together and we knew enough to be dangerous, you know? Right. But we also kind of realized that. So we wanted to learn and, and still like be willing to receive. But yeah, I remember meeting like Jason outside of a harvest crusade. Mm. And he had like these just thoughtful answers to the guys that were like outside protesting. Remember yeah. that, like with yeah, the yeah, 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 and yeah. stuff. You Jason know, like, Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jay Martin, man, yeah. Jason Martin. He yeah. he just yeah. He'd always have like he'd be ready to go with some thought. Yeah, you know. Um, and then yeah, even like Aaron. I met a lot of those guys playing basketball, but mm. then yeah, like just other ones just came through other other things, you know. But mm -hmm. there was just something about meeting those guys. It just took one encounter, and then you were you were linked up from mm -hmm. there, you mm -hmm. know. And then everything else just kind of naturally flowed mm -hmm. from that. So yeah, we spent a lot of time reading. I mean, ha having the Harvest Bookstore was crazy, man. You just had access to all this content, like right. stuff that was like contemporary now and then like old stuff you know like lloyd jones like roman's commentaries augustine's work like i was like what is going on at his bookstore man everything was in there and so it was like a it was like a giant library on church campus yeah he was going yeah. there and they even had the the old used book section yeah and uh you could find all kinds of crazy stuff it was really cool they did a great job yeah so it was just it was yeah it was just a rich time of like yeah, these guys, we all wanted to learn something, you know, mm -hmm. from each other. And we spent time actually, like, not just trying to learn, but, like, actually follow Jesus in the way we lived our lives, mm -hmm. you know, whether mm -hmm. from, like, prayer meetings to all-night prayer meetings yes, to to confessing our sin and trying to grow and change. Yes. Like, there was just, yeah, it was, man. And at the time, like, you didn't know it was happening, right? you know, but, like, we were all very much, like, discipling each other, yeah. being discipled by each other, you know? So. Yes, it was crucial, man. No, it, it was so special. I like, um, it's funny, the the fasting and prayer sessions and our all-night prayer sessions or a few hour prayer sessions, oh, whatever yeah, that yeah. was. <laughs> Dave, we would like, basically we would, we would fast for a day or two. I don't remember what it was. Yeah. But it was so funny because I don't even when I reflect back on the fasting time, it's like, okay, we're going to say no to the flesh, you know, for like a full 24 hours, you know? Yeah. But at the end of that fast... <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like basically nine ten o'clock at night we order like 20 pizzas you know it just like so all right bad, <laughs> it's like we're going to now stuff our yeah. faces with like pizzas then we're going to go into the theater and try and like pray and maybe we prayed right. prior to that i don't remember but it was absolutely hilarious Dude, was, yeah that was that was one of my first experiences of trying to fast yeah which was actually great to fast with people totally i know sometimes like we talk today about like you know yeah fasting as jesus teaches us like we don't we don't share it with people, you know, but there is something to be said about fasting with, with people. I think that's encouraging, mm -hmm. you know, or fasting for a common thing mm -hmm. in someone's life, you know, whether it's healing or whatever they're working through. But that was, that was a really helpful experience, mm -hmm. even though I was like, what mm -hmm. are we yeah. doing? We're that like, day we went and saw a movie, some of us did, and I remember being at the counter like, damn, I can't get no popcorn, <laughs> can't get no raisinets, you know. But like, it's okay, we just got to make it through this film, and it'll be dinner time. <laughs> and then we met at Rox and Ash's yeah. house yeah, at yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah, we ordered so much pizza. Yeah. And then we prayed, and some of us fell asleep. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. The infamous, uh, yes, the infamous falling asleep during the prayers. I put a blanket over myself. And oh, I think, it's I think so I good. Went, I was gone. I woke up. We're still praying. Yes. It was hard, you know. Yeah. It was it was it was difficult because we would do this like yeah. we would pray in the middle of the night, and it's like in this theater, which we called the Cornell Hotel. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was uh, Ashley and Rock's, you know, house mm -hmm. and uh, beautiful home um, and great place of Bible study and fellowship and oh, partying yeah. and hanging out. And they would let us go in there and pray late at night. And the brothers would go in there and we're all holy and ready to go. And we'd be on our knees praying and begging God, which again was so fruitful and awesome. And yeah. Yeah. just the fact that we did this stuff, you know, like it was ministering to our souls. But uh, just like Peter, just like James, just like the disciples, you know, we couldn't watch and pray but one hour. You know, we were, we were... We were snoozing often and like trying to stay awake and the brothers would be making fun of each other and yeah. having a good time. Yeah, it was a trip, man. Classic moments. Um, a lot of Bible study, a lot of partying, a lot of fellowship. Yeah, they're at the house. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a, an epicenter of growth and um, a lot of ministry took place there at the house. Yeah, I just remember we just, we found ways to get together around the Sunday gathering, the Friday night gathering. Like we just would make it a priority to like share our lives with each other, mm -hmm. you know? So as I try to think back, like there were so many relationships that were birthed out of that, mm -hmm. you know? But it was often because we were all just saying no to a lot of other things so mm -hmm. that we can say yes to, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll hang out till late at night, you mm -hmm. know? And it was just a, a weird moment of like, we were all in a similar season of life where we had some of that capacity mm -hmm. to do that, you know? Some of us did not, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there, yeah, either because we were still in school. I was still in college at the time, working part time. So, like, yeah, I was. <laughs> any moment I had, man, was like just with hang with hanging out with everyone mm -hmm. rather than study. So, so my grades started to drop. But yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we like never stopped hanging out. It was like years upon years of just uh, late nights. And again, I loved. <clears throat> my favorite part about that time is that though when we look back on it, we see a lot of foolishness, you know, there's a lot of foolishness wrapped up in the heart of young men, oh, but yeah. there was, but there was a genuine, a, a genuine authentic desire just to know Jesus yeah. and to help each other grow to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I love the pureness of all of that. There yeah. was no, I mean, I don't know if you feel this way, Fredo, but it's crazy how complex, you know, life and relationships get as you get older. I always thought as we get older, it gets easier. Yeah. It's going to be a piece of cake, you know, and it's, it's just interesting. Even as I watch uh, my own life, as I watch um, my parents, as I watch, mm. you know, as, as, I, as I watch the world around me, like try to navigate relationships and I reflect back on that season, it was just like, I don't know. It there was just a pure desire just to run and love the Lord and try to minister and build up. And that's, that's, and it happened at such a heightened level, you know, it's, yeah, it's a uh, desert wilderness of sorts, you know, that I often retreat back to in my own mind. And that's why I love talking about this on, on the podcast, because it's just the reminiscing and the, and the seeing what God did. There was so much, so much pure growth, you know, during that season. Oh yeah. 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 Well, I think what, what something that you did, I think that was immensely helpful was this was like post your Mexico trip. Mm. And so I think you came out of an environment in which discipleship was the center of everything we were doing, right? It wasn't like a church program. Like you were, 
you were bathed in like just a discipleship environment for months in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So you come back to Riverside, like modern life. Mm -hmm. I think maybe you, whether you realize it or not, you were, I think, subconsciously pulling from that experience mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And then that just like overflowed into all of your relationships, into the work you did, you know? Because yeah, you worked for a big church at the time, but you were so <laughs> not right. big church. Right, like, right, right. You just did things so unorthodox, right. you know? <laughs> and I think there was something magnetic about that, yeah. like because there was a simplicity to how you modeled following Jesus. And then I think a lot of us just wanted to pick up on that mm -hmm. and, do, and do that similarly, you know? Mm -hmm. Ironically, we were in a large church environment mm -hmm. doing it all together, but... There was just so much unorthodox practices mm -hmm. to you that I think were very attractive for a lot of us because it just seemed like, oh yeah, this is like the bare bones of like following Jesus in your everyday life, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and we were all wanting to get better at that. And we felt like something big was coming. And I think what it was, was just like ordinary life. Like you're talking about the complexity of ordinary life and growing up. And that's kind of what I think we were praying for. Yes. Even though we didn't realize it, you know, right. we we're just like something big is happening. Right. It's like, oh yeah, it's your your adult life right. is coming. You know, let's let's get it. So new coming adult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's what we were praying and for, like almost preparing for, it, even though we didn't fully realize it at that moment. Yeah, totally. Know, so. For marriage, for kids, yeah. for life, for all of that, and we definitely it was laying a foundation of Jesus and relationship with Him in our lives that uh, would um, would carry us all the way. Yeah. Um, till today. Um, really, I reflect back on those times often and I'm thankful for the brothers. We did man retreats. Oh man. Yes, we did. <laughs> we, we go into the wilderness and blow stuff up and fish and barbecue Some of together. us cut our legs in the river with no doctors in sight to treat. <laughs> Reference uh, episode one of the podcast and you'll yeah. hear Dion give a nice description. of. Oh Friday. yeah. I watched Dion. You know, Dion's recounting of the story is an interesting one. <laughs> Are you saying it's not accurate? Oh, it, I mean, it's mostly accurate. It's mostly accurate. Uh, I just, I still don't know how I got this gash in uh, my leg, bro. I still have a dent no. in my shin. Are you serious? Yeah, from that moment. Like, I cannot help but, like, think about that story. Wait, you, so we're in the canoes. Yeah, we're in the canoe. You and I river. were in the canoe together. Okay. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're in the canoe. And at one point... It's towards the end of like us just going down river and we're just kind of walking through and I just misstep and I just get this massive gash. Was the gash from a rock or from the canoe? I think it's a rock. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a rock. Yeah. No. But at one point <laughs> we hit like a halfway point and we stopped and we looked back and see, I think it was Don and Steve for us. I was like, Hey bro, should we, should we switch up? We're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Cause at that point Don was, Don was kayaking for two at that moment, dude. <laughs> And like, when I say two, like, like 2.7. The kayak was like that. And yeah. like, yeah. And he's like in the front, like trying Man's to like. paddles barely in the water. Oh, it was hilarious. But yeah, it was just after a long day of like, we. it was so fun. I don't even know where we, I couldn't tell you where we're at. Like I could not drive us there right now, but it was a it was a pretty beautiful place. We were so. somewhere like five hours north in like Fresno, but yeah. I don't remember exactly, yeah, the, the off ramps, but. Uh, one of the guys had found some property of a friend, um, again, out in the boons somewhere. And uh, he said we could go up there and uh, basically, <laughs> you know, uh, hunt pigs and, uh, you know, set up tents and fish and canoe and all the rest. Yeah. And so we we're like, that sounds like a fun wilderness experience. Let's just go for it. Yo, we never saw one pig. Just... I did not see a single pig. <laughs> I didn't get to fire my gun except for like maybe at a tree. <laughs> it was so funny. We did a lot of practicing. We did, we did a lot of training of the uh, firing of weapons. But I got video of this, man. Like we're sitting there in front of this lake thing. And like, I don't know, it's this lake pond w that was on this property. And again, mind you, this is like 100 acres of land or I don't know. It's all yeah. private land. Like we're out in the middle of nowhere. And everybody's testing their their firearms and don't worry we had marines on site who were like gun safety highest level yelling at us to like point that gun down and all yeah, this yeah, it was yeah. crazy but we literally all at one time was like ready aim fire and like we blow up this lake like we're literally just like boom 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 boom, boom going off and i was like stepping back like this is crazy man i mean yeah, the stuff that we did it was so wild yeah a lot yeah, of fun it, it was fun adventure. Though. we had a few nights though it was like it was great, man. I, th I remember I was confessing sin, mm. but then also speaking like almost prophetically over one another's lives, you know, like it was a, uh, yeah, it was a beautiful time. Beautiful yes. Time, so. Yes. It was this, uh, yeah, man, it, it was, 
I remember it. Yeah, I remember that moment vividly because I remember realizing that I didn't think I knew the brothers really well. I thought that, you know, we all knew each other really well. I mean, mm -hmm. we were always talking to each other. But like even something happened in that circle on that night because I remember once the confession started, it was like dominoes. Yeah. It was like the first brother confesses and like the second brother confesses deeper and the third brother confesses deeper and the fourth brother even deeper. And I was just like looking as we went around the circle and there was a freedom. Mm -hmm. There was a freedom. Like, I know these guys love me. I know they're for me. There's almost nothing I can say that could turn anybody away right now. So I'm just going to be honest. This is what's going on, guys. You know, I got this, 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 this. And there was m like magical healing that was taking place oh, yeah. in the confession. Yeah. And then I think what you pointed out, one of the most powerful things is that after the confession, after a moment of darkness, like in your own soul, as you're like pouring out and, and also trying to receive healing, you, you feel like you, you've, you've shamed yourself or you've, you've exposed part of your life, but you feel free. Then a brother shows up and speaks mm -hmm. over you and says, you are this and you are this and I see this in you and you are that and we believe this in you. And as the brothers go by and everybody's like cheering each other on, just like, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. brother is like lifted, he lifted the heavens like in that moment. And I remember that from my own soul. Yeah. But I remember seeing that on the brothers and it was, it was a iconic moment because I don't know the depths of confession and the depths of, um, yeah, almost, almost prophetic word over each other was, uh, was special. And, uh, you don't see that very often and it takes a lot of intimacy to get to that place. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, uh, trying to hunt pigs and canoeing and yeah. barbecuing <laughs> and crawdad hunting. Um, and then, uh, with the desire to worship Jesus and know each other better and to help yeah. each other, seemed to bring that forth yeah it was huge man and that was probably right right around 2009 because mm. i feel like we had spent some time together mm -hmm. leading up to that trip and so yeah and then uh you met your wife uh right around that time yeah yeah because i uh i had known ashley she had been a part of harvest for a while she got saved at a uh high school camp really mm -hmm. she oh. came to faith up at a high school camp and then like that kind of just lit a fire in her family, got rocks to go to church, and mm -hmm. then got Donna to go to church, you know. And so, and she had actually been praying for me for years. She thought I was really? pretty cute. Hey. And, uh, and so, yeah, right after she graduated from high school, her and I got a bit more serious about our relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we started dating in, uh, in 2009, that same year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. And you got married and uh you let me uh you Yeah, let me dude. Wedding. Yeah, you officiated our wedding. You yeah, read from wedding. Ashley's I think prayer journal too at the wow. ceremony. Um her prayer that yeah that I would see Jesus through her eyes. So mm. I mean I saw a lot in her eyes, mm. let's be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I I did that prayer request got answered. I saw Jesus too, you know, and so And you guys have uh, two kids now. Yeah, Eli and Ella. Eli's 9, Ella's Ella's 5. So mm. You guys been married how many years? Uh, we're going on 12 years. Mm. Yeah, we got married in 2011. Praise God. Yeah, man. Um, you, not long after you guys were married, you uh, you went to seminary. Yeah, yeah. So right in, I graduated from UCR 2009 um, and then started seminary like shortly after that, kind of online because I didn't want to leave the church, man. I didn't want to leave like our community, right. you know. But at that time, you could only do so many units online. And so right. I'm like, man, I need to move out there. Yeah, I just knew nobody. Like Daniel Hooper knew one guy at the time who was at Southern. Wow. And Southern was just a school that like a lot of guys were writing books and their books ended up at the Harvest right. Bookstore. Right. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go to Southern. I think Christianity Day called it like the the coffee shop of seminaries at the mm. time. Like it's just where people wanted to go and mm -hmm. hang out, you know. So yeah, I found my way at Southern. Um, a year after that is when Ash and I officially got married and then she moved out there with mm. me for about a mm -hmm. year. And then I moved back in 2012 mm. and, uh, you were, I think officially like an actual pastor at the time at mm -hmm. Harvest overseeing mm -hmm. Woodcrest maybe. Yeah. Something like that. So yeah, we yeah. moved back and then started going, started going there mm -hmm. and then, um, yeah. And then we, then we started scheming from that point. So, yes. But, yeah, Southern was a formidable time, man. I, I love it. I love it not just because of the education, but because of the church I got to be a part of. I mm. love the church out there. Mm. Some of the relationships I formed out there, like I still keep in contact uh, with some of them. Sojourn? So, yeah, Sojourn Community Church. Sojourn. Yeah, yeah it was a church. So, 
I thought I would stay there for a long time too until this teaching opportunity came up back here in Riverside. Yes. And so I thought, oh man, this could be my ticket to get back home, be yeah. with the boys. Yeah. And uh, it was good, man. It was really, really good. When you reflect back on the on that time in seminary, you know, um, yeah, what some of the nuggets that you took away f- from the whole experience? Oh man, that there's a handful of people who are in seminary who probably shouldn't be in seminary. Mm. Um, I say that because the hardest day on campus was Sunday, mm. like seeing people not leave their places of like home, like their apartments or their dorm rooms mm-hmm. to like go to service. That was wow. like kind of eye opening, like, dang, you wow. know, interesting. So that's a nugget I think on, um, I think about some of the best professors were the ones who were actually like pastoring too. And mm-hmm. so I felt like what they were teaching was so embodied into like actual experiences from church, mm-hmm. you know? And so, um, I love my time with Russell Moore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I remember when I was dating Ash at the time, she would get so sick of me talking about Russ Moore. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, well, yeah, what does Dr. Moore have to say? Because <laughs> I just would cite him all the time. Yeah. He's just such an impressionable professor. You know, mm-hmm. I, I still appreciate his voice. Um, but yeah, I think I think just learning from guys who were also doing church ministry at the time was really, really helpful, mm-hmm. you know. And the professors who had like a humility in their teaching where they were willing to learn from different schools of thought, right? Because it was a Baptist seminary. Right. And so you're getting indoctrinated in Baptist theology. Right. But the ones that kind of stuck out to me were the ones who actually like pulled the best from other schools of thinking too, whether it's like Presbyterians or Anglicans mm. or uh, Roman Catholics, right? They just had a way of like, here, go read this. You may not agree with everything, but go read this, check them out, mm. you know? So I remember I took a class on James and Dr. Rock- Robert Plummer had me read... Uh, I can't think of the man's name, but it was a, a Catholic perspective on the book of James. Mm. And it was just a Greek translation. And it was like really insightful, mm. you know? And so there's just moments like that, that I feel like I loved the nuggets where I got to see people who kind of just pulled from a variety of thinking mm-hmm. and kind of let them inform them, you mm. know? And I think that was really, really helpful mm-hmm. and really shaping. So, yeah. Um, oftentimes we kind of get stuck in our own tribe. You know, we find ourselves locked oh, yeah. in, uh, um, and I don't, I, I don't know. I feel like a black sheep oftentimes, you know, like <laughs> I, I don't know where I fit, you know? Yeah. Um, Same, man. I don't know where I'm at now. Um, I, you know, I was raised Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was the worship leader. Um, I stepped into a Calvary Chapel. Um, I, I, I don't, you know, I went to Mexico with John Corson, you know, this mystic. Yeah. You know, in Calvary Chapel. Um and then uh, even coming out here to LA, you know, it's, uh, I mean, obviously Greg Laurie, Pastor Greg influenced me a ton. Yeah. And um, and then stepping out here and did a little bit of seminary with John MacArthur. And then, uh, I don't know, you know, now I, I, I find myself, we, we studied, uh, we studied Center Church with Tim Keller, you know, yeah. as we were as we were launching the church. Rest in peace, man. I know, and uh, di- you know, yeah, that book was massive that we went through. You just think about all of these, the, you know, all of these perspectives, and mm-hmm. I like to think of the church as a kaleidoscope. You know, it is. Oh yeah, you know, it, it's multifaceted, and it, and we look from so many different angles, so many different directions, and. <clears throat> I mean, it's really awesome. I think diving into seminary and being able to see the bigger picture, you know, and not getting uh, so perfectly locked into one lane, but right. again, being able to download all that they would have yeah. and also being able to see beyond the borders is sometimes we get, we get so locked in our tribe and then we're stuck there and we can't even appreciate, you know, we can't appreciate anybody yeah. uh, else in the body of Christ. You know, we, we can only yeah. appreciate people who are perfectly like us. Yeah. And when you think about like the witness of the Holy Spirit, the church has been around thousands of years. Mm. The Spirit has been speaking and leading mm. all variety of like congregations, mm. denominations, you know, thinking and writing. And so it is, yeah, it's it's to our benefit that we like listen to the witness of the Spirit through a variety of voices, mm. you know, and then and, and allow ourselves to kind of come to a conclusion that we feel like suited with, you know. Um, and I mean that in the sense of like how we maybe not prioritize certain things like with orthodoxy is real clear. Sure. Right? Totally. But underneath those things, I think we have like the liberty to kind of come to places that, you know, that are, that just round us out well, I think, mm-hmm. you know, and they, like I said, they just bear witness to the history of the church and the way the spirit's been leading mm-hmm. for so many years. So, 
Like a, uh, the Brotherhood was a microcosm of that. Oh, for sure. Yeah, That's we'd funny. fight over all kinds of stuff. Man. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember me yelling at uh, Jay in in the Cornell Hotel? I do. Yeah. yeah. You remember me yelling? You know, we're we're discussing some you know thing, and uh, yeah, and I was so angry. Yeah, I was so mad for it. I like I couldn't put it down. Yeah. Well, I, unfortunately, I'll say it like this. Unfortunately, I feel like Reformed theology got the best and the worst of us at mm. the time, you mm. know, um, in that, like, it, it helped us dive into scripture and gave us like great categories and exposed us to great teaching. But then the worst of it is that it didn't shape our hearts mm. yet, you know? And so I think some of those arguments were birthed out of some of us being educated beyond our ability to actually obey Jesus, you yeah. know, and love the way he loved. And so, yeah, there was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that turned into some yeah. fun conversations, you know, and then I look back and I'm like, thank God no one recorded any of that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like handing a machine gun to a 16 year old or something. Oh, and it's just sure, like, you have man. no idea. For it's, sure. you know, it's, it's knowledge without wisdom, you know, and, it, yeah. um, and, and, uh, without tact, without tone, without any of those things. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but it's, it's even today, you know, when I reflect on all the brothers and where everybody's at and this podcast actually has just, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's just, um, it was, it's kind of a test. Like, I don't yeah. even know what it's going to do, you know, but yeah. it's been cool that, um, so many people have reached out and have and been able to connect and have conversations just ab about the conversations. Wow. and. And it's fun to be able to um, look into everyone's life, regardless of where they're at um, yeah. in this stage of life, um, where they, w what they feel about their own stage of life, just being able to celebrate, you know, where yeah. everybody's at and what God is doing and keep cheering each other on. And um, I love that, you know, because we need it more than ever. We did it when we were young. Mm. Uh, we must do it when we're old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we outdo one another in showing honor. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to continue to pour and that's what we did and just watch God take care of the rest. You know, yeah. um, there is, um, sadly, you know, there's been so much division in the church, you know, over the last oh, yeah. four or five years. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know, it's been part of my heart to help try to stitch a lot of that up or repair a lot of that, um, by the grace of God Yeah. everywhere that we possibly can. And, um, I, I, you look at our group, you look at our crew from the past and what an eclectic, uh, different people, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, called out of darkness into his marvelous light, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's funny just to, to reflect and look and see, uh, where we're at and where everybody has gone. And, uh, I don't know, you know, what else are we supposed to do? We got to keep, you know, encouraging right. each other, keep building each other yeah, and cheering each other on. Yeah, absolutely, man. So seminary, then back to Riverside. Yeah, I came back to Riverside. You were a, a campus pastor at the time. I started yes. teaching a high school Bible. Yeah, was such a trip, man. At Woodcrest. Yeah, at Woodcrest Christian. So I found myself back at the back place. Back at the school. Yeah, that I said I would never go back to. Yes, <laughs> yes. But, man, I loved it. They were just such formidable years because for every day, for 50 minutes, you had to like keep these kids' attention. I taught freshmen, like the New Testament survey. So we just went from Matthew to Revelation. I had juniors and we, we did a, what was called hermeneutics. So it was like Bible interpretation, like here's how to read and interpret mm. scripture. And then eventually I taught a senior course on theology and apologetics and kind of like worldview. You know, mm -hmm. we would use that term then, worldview. Um, and then eventually was a vice principal there. They, they let me be a vice principal, which yes, is crazy. I remember that, man. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I loved it, man. I love such an honoring time, such a shaping time. Mm. Um, a lot of, you know, people oftentimes will appreciate the way I explain things or the way I teach. And honestly, it was rooted in having to teach high schoolers. Every really? Day. Yeah. I felt like I found a voice and developed a way of communication that I felt like was effective for them. Mm that I think also is kind of translated in other places as well. It's like re like thinking through their mind, f figuring out. Yeah, how to just trying to way. honor their questions or honor their place of life. And then how would I explain this to a high schooler? It's one thing to write it for a paper in a seminary class, right? right? Like on a, the adoption or the theology of union with Christ, you right. know, but like, how do you help a freshman make sense of this? Right. You know? Um, and so it was, uh, yeah, it was a rich time in my life, just every day trying to think through, okay, how am I going to help someone, mm. <laughs> someone understand mm. this, you know, in a compelling way. And I started teaching at 25 years old, which was nuts. So 
I was actually closer in age to some of these students wow. than I was like some of my coworkers, like wow. in the faculty, you wow. know? So it was like, I think so the students would look at me and like, they didn't know what to do with me because right. here's this younger person, you know, who has to like dress nice every day, but like, we'll still wear Jordans occasionally, you know? <laughs> and like, we'll talk about everyday life and listen to their music, but then also like help them explain, you know, what Deuteronomy is all about, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, uh, yeah, it was a formidable time, man. You became a fan favorite of the school. The young people loved you there. And yeah, I think so. And you were able to impact a lot of people including uh, one of Matt Brown's kids. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's pretty much how I ended up at Sandals. I mean, first, before that, we had done a lot of prep and praying to get Legacy off the ground, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I think we read through, you mentioned Center Church, which is like Tim Keller's like magnum opus on here's how to plant a church, yeah. you know, and, and organize them. Dude, it's an incredible book. Yeah. An incredible book from, yeah, one of the most brilliant guys you know, the Christian world's ever we seen. We met for probably, what do you think, like eight months? Like, yeah, close to a year yeah. at the same Starbucks. Yes. Ordered the same thing. The ladies there, they got used to us. Sam so they'd, yeah, they'd have our they'd have our orders ready. Like Saturday mornings, like yeah. six or seven a.m. Something Early like that. Saturday mornings yeah. for about two and a half hours, and we just like would plot through it, make decisions on, on what this would look like for Legacy, mm -hmm. you know, and then go about the rest of our lives. So It was crazy, man. Yeah. It was crazy time. Yeah, it was really formidable. <sighs> Yeah, we were, um, we like had a meeting at my house and then we would meet at the Starbucks and mm -hmm. then we were driving down to LA trying to find a building. Yeah. And uh, I told Pastor Greg, like, I think we want to plant a church, like, um, I think we're going to go for it. You know, he's like, where you want to do it, LA? Really? You know, yeah, I think so. You know, <laughs> like, okay, we'll go try to find a building. That yeah. took like eight or nine months to find a building. Yeah. We found Bridges Academy. Dude, walking into Bridges the first time was such a dream though, man. Crazy compared to everything else that was out there, and then you know, hopefully they're not listening. But the price they were giving it to us at was great at the time. Yes, like, it was nuts, and they had that storage under the stage. Like there were just so many things that made sense. Because I remember the first time we walked in there, I think it was like during school or like they were doing a play or something, and I just remember seeing this like this gym space. Like oh my gosh, this is it. Yes. You know? And then office space, you know, for other stuff. Like, yeah, it was it was quite the moment, man. It was quite the moment. You helped me uh, write out a ton of the underworkings of the church. Yeah, the church do governance. Doctrinal statements, bylaws, uh, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, many of you guys don't know, but Fredo is kind of the, he, he was basically helping build the framework, you know, to our yeah. church and really helped me think through a lot of this stuff. Um, we're asking lots of questions and trying to get it down on paper. And again, we, we had been, we had been talking about this stuff for years, but again, now to like put it down on paper and make it official, I was so nervous about this stuff. You know, it's yeah. like, this is going to go down on paper for a church and we want adults, you know, to be able to walk in here and read something and, and yeah. understand it. And so I don't know, it was, it was incredible, man. It was a, a great foundation laid. Yeah. Yeah. It was a beautiful time, man. Yeah. It was, it was cool to see not just like the years of our friendship and our community develop into like, dang, we're going to do a church now, but just like also the, the immediate practice of anything I was learning at the time was like, all right, let's, let's put this to work, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was a, uh, it was a rich time, man. It was really, really good. And we, uh, we launched it by the grace of God. Like I was so nervous. We're going to burn up all the cash and like not have anything left, you know, by the end of the year, but um, by the grace of God, you know, it, everything took off. Pastor Greg helped in his support for a while. Yeah. And, um, and people, you know, made, got us chairs and we got sound system and the team showed up, Fredo and his wife and a black tarp uh, for the just, windows. Yes. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Hanging that dude. Oh Hanging my. That drape, man. Yes. Yes. That was something else. Blood, sweat and tears, yeah. um, set up, tear down all that stuff happening. And really, we didn't know what we were doing. We're just like swinging for the fence. Like, God, yeah. you know, just please, you know, show up and do something. You know, I was reflecting on, you wrote the script for that commercial uh, launch video that we did uh, where I'm walking through the streets, like talking about LA. And it's Yo, like, oh, yeah. that's crazy. Right that's right. You wrote the script for that. I like tweaked it maybe like 5% or something. I was just like trying to put it into my own language, but yeah. you wrote the script for that. The thing has almost 2 million views now. <laughs> Does it really? 2 million views. Man, that's a trip. One point a million on YouTube. I'm just like, is that when we like release the logo and everything yeah, too? Yeah. And yeah, oh man, it's like yeah, yeah. The logo's on there, I think, and um, yeah, it's just like telling people like you know, 
pray for us, you know, join us if you'd like to support us. Yeah, yeah. like it, it was kind of that like two or three minute. And it was like Fredo wrote the script. Um, Derek showed up with his iPhone. It was like shooting the shots. <laughs> I don't know how we got the audio. Like, I don't know who had the love or like what we were, or maybe we used an, you know, an iPhone with like the, it, it was so classic, but I was just like, yeah. it's, it's our most watched video on, on YouTube. It's insane. Man. Yeah. That's crazy. We just celebrate nine years. Praise God praise by the God, grace of God. Man, that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been a wild journey, long journey, but yeah. um, couldn't have done it. Uh, couldn't have done it without you. Couldn't have done it without the team. Thanks, couldn't have done man. it. Yeah. Impossible. Thanks. You know, um, I think one, my favorite thing about those times is, I don't know if you remember, but I was so nervous. I was so scared. You know, like I was, uh, I, I didn't know how to take that risk, but because there were so many around that were all saying like, we can do this, like, yeah. let's just do it. Let's just go. You know, it's just like, let's just see what happens. You know, let's just take the risk. Yeah. And, uh, Again, you know, stay foolish, stay hungry. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> foolish enough to do it, you know, hungry enough to, to keep going. And yeah. um, by the grace of God, you know, we still, we're still here. Yeah. Well, you've always been a dynamic visionary, you know. And so even if you feel like you're not prepared, you can get up and probably convince 20 people to follow you. <laughs> you know, like you just. Thank you, you Fredo. Yeah. It, it, you just have a gift of being a visionary, you know. <laughs> Um, but also like with the desire to like shepherd real people in real life, you yes. know? And so I think that was like compelling, you know, for the brothers to stay and to be committed to that, you know, to the point where you can get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a hard thing too for me in that season was realizing my calling was going to be back at home. Mm. Um, it was a hard, it was a hard kind of dream to, to let die in a mm -hmm. sense, you know, mm -hmm. just the way that life had unfolded at that time for my family. Mm -hmm. And, and being willing to say no to a good thing. It was probably one of the first times in my life where I realized like saying no to a beautiful thing was the will of God yeah. and embracing like limitations in that moment, you yeah. know? Um, and it was, it was important for our family. There were a few other moments where Ash and I came to a crossroads where we thought maybe we'd go to New York, mm. um, maybe we'd go here or there. And so we looked back and we're like, we're so grateful that like we we made the decision we did and knowing how things have unfolded, mm -hmm. you know, it just it just made yeah, it makes more sense now than it mm -hmm. did then, mm -hmm. you know. And so but it's been beautiful to watch from afar, like yeah. what legacy has become, you know. So it's yeah. been it's been good. Praise God. And yeah. you had the opportunity to step into sandals with Matt Brown. Yeah. And yeah. uh like Love. you said, I started teaching uh, Madison. Mm -hmm. Madison was a junior at the time. And um, yeah, she just went home and started talking about her Bible teacher. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, he, so, and uh, yeah, no, Matt, um, ah, it's weird. Like when You've I, known him for years. Yeah, there's a flash like through my head. Basically, yeah. Matt has uh, encouraged me over probably two decades. I don't know. I probably met him when I was around 20 years old, 21. Uh, yeah. I used to go to his Sunday nights at CBU and sit there in the front row. Mm. And uh, Matt has encouraged me. I've surfed with Matt. He has rebuked me and corrected me. Uh, he came and taught the upper room one time. Did he really? He came and wow. taught the upper room. Hunter kids showed up that night in Robert Hill's house. No way. Crazy. Yeah. And, um, this is, see only you, bro. Only yeah. you can yeah, pull yeah, yeah. Matt yeah, yeah, yeah. for a Tuesday night Bible study. Well, it's a trip to me at because it's like, yeah, well, you look what God has done at Sandals and through Pastor Matt and through yeah. you, Fredo. It's like, you step back and like, oh man, I mean, if you guys don't know what's happened with Sandals, you know, you just go look up, look up the church and the website and just all the work that God has done. It's been incredible to see yeah. the multiplication of disciples and raising of pastors and just, just amazing stuff has happened. But yeah, I, I, I remember, you know, 20 years ago, you know, and I, uh, I remember Matt rebuking me in his office, you know, like I just, wow. which I, I'm thankful for, you know, yeah. he, he took time, uh, tried to get me to be real with myself, others and God. <laughs> and, uh, and I, and I was trying to, uh, yeah. but, um, but yeah, you made the connection with Matt and uh, came on staff at Sandals. Yeah, and have been teaching pastor and campus pastor. Yeah, and uh, now online campus pastor. Yeah, so I started out. I was still working at Woodcrest as a vice principal slash teacher, and I joined Sandals kind of part time. And I was I was somewhat nervous of joining such like an established church. I mean, we had just launched Legacy. I was grieving not being there anymore, needing to stay in Riverside. 
And so the like invitation to join a large church was like, ah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. We had just started doing communion every service. Remember that? Like we mm-hmm. set up communion tables mm-hmm. at I do Legacy. Remember. Yes. So that people can respond to the service. That's and like, right. so there was just like all these things like we were experimenting with and trying in our services to help allow people like a, like a moment with Christ, you know? And, uh, and so they were just stepping into a larger church that's got like a set. Here's how we do everything. Mm hmm was, was kind of hard to work through. And I took months. Matt would tell you I took a long time and mm-hmm. I did, I took a long time and uh, eventually joined their team as like a part-time, just helping get young adults off the ground. Mm-hmm. So I did that for about two years. I joined full-time in 2017. Mm. And then shortly after that, a, a church voted to join our church and get revitalized and become Sandals Church Palm Avenue. And then I became the campus pastor there, mm. was there for a number of years and then just recently transitioned into yeah, uh, an online campus pastor role. So, mm. and over the course of time, started teaching pastor. Like I remember the first time Matt, he called me up. I was at the barbershop getting a haircut. And he's like, "Hey, you're going to teach next weekend." I'm like, "What?" <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're we run a series on the Ten Commandments. He's mm. like, "Your first sermon is this is going to be it." So mm-hmm. I taught on the Sabbath, and uh, ever since then, man, I haven't haven't stopped. So awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was a trip, man. But that wasn't the first time. I remember the first time I actually met him. I don't know if you remember this. So if you don't know this about Josh, Josh loves fish. Do you still have fish at the house? I do. I he does. He does. Office. What's your oldest fish? Uh, my oldest fish now? I don't know. Sheesh. I got a... You probably got like a 40-year-old barracuda no, or something. No, like no, no, no. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, 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 got, I set up a tank for the kids. Pretty big tank. But yeah, it's a community tank. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I knew it. Yeah, dude. Is tank. it freshwater or saltwater? Freshwater on this oh, one. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, dude, yeah. so at one point, Josh got all the brothers to buy fish yeah. tanks. Dude. <laughs> We're literally broke college. We have no business. We should be investing... I should be paying you down like debt, like preparing for a home. And here I am at freaking PetSmart <laughs> buying a tank. Yeah. But anyways, I was with you. We were on our way to go to PetSmart and Pastor Matt rolls up next to us in his truck. Did he really? Yeah. And he had a surfboard in the back. And you're like, yeah. yo, Matt. Yeah. He had his long hair. Do you remember this at yeah, all? Yeah, I don't remember Dude, it. You're like, that's Pastor Matt. He leads Sandals Church. I'm like, oh, Crazy. Man. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And it, unfortunately at the time, like, there were reputations back and forth between Harvest and Sandals, you right. know. But I loved, like, you. yeah, you always had a friendship with him. You know, yeah. you knew him. But, yeah, that was the first time I ever waved or seen him was yeah. we were on our way to Pest Mart to buy yeah. fish. Yeah. And uh, he rolled up next to us in this little beater truck. Classic. Yeah. Yeah, he had a... He had a he had the two door Tacoma. I remember. Yeah, 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 it was like it white was, or something like that. It's a but. great truck, man. It's actually like the classic surfer truck now. Like everybody just buys that Tacoma and throws yeah. boards in the back. So yeah, he was on to something. That was my first time ever meeting him. On my way to buy fish, dude. <laughs> buy fish with this guy. Of course, no, it's classic. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Oh, um, I don't know if you know this. When we when we launched the church, I hit Matt up. And uh, I just said, like, hey, I wonder if we could do lunch. I just want to pick your brain about, like, church, you know? Oh, wow. He took me to Market Broiler and sat down and just, like, poured for, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours or whatever. Wow. And I'm just sitting there, you know, just reflecting. I, again, like, praise God for, like, all of these relationships and, um, yeah, instrumental, you know, yeah. fathers of the faith or men, like, who have stepped in to try to love and serve us, you know, and, and, and groom us, you know, into pastors and into ministry. And obviously I'm thankful for pastor Greg. It's a trip that Matt stepped into harvest and used to sit in there and yeah, that's where he uh, gave his life to Christ, man. Amazing. Right. Yeah. And then now, uh, to, um, massively influence, uh, in, mm-hmm. influencing churches in the same city. Yeah. Bringing people uh, to Jesus, discipling, building up and, uh, yeah, no, it's been a joy uh, to reflect on and just watch how the stories like intertwine and how all that stuff has come about. Yeah. Yeah, it's been cool. It's been a, such a gift to be there. Matt is uh, such a relational leader, a lot like you in that, like just down to earth. We'll chat with anyone, not even knowing it's Cooper Cup, yeah. you know, or something like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Cooper, if you're listening, you know, right. Josh should know who you Cooper. Were. Sorry, dude. Yeah. I'm, I stink and drop the ball, like literally. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So yeah, it's just been, it's been great to be there. Um, watch the church grow. There's 14 church campuses now. Wow. The online ministry reaches people all over the world. You know, like this weekend we're having a family from Australia that essentially runs a house church. We call them Sandals Church Anywhere. Mm-hmm. And they're going to be in our, they're going to be hanging out with us. And so, wow. yeah, so it's, it's such a gift to see, Exciting. to see what happens, man. And uh, yeah, so it's been, it's been a great number of years being there. And I, um, 
I bet a, um, a blessing to be able to see from the back end how all of this happens and all of it's built out and like how, how uh, you can take um, technology of today and opportunity that sits there today, churches that uh, need revitalization, be able to step in and help them, um, yeah, I guess come back to life, you know, um, yeah. like Palm. You know, I, I stepped into Palm as a kid with Kyle Polston. Wow. I used to go to VBS over there. Wow. And so it was a trip when Fredo, when I heard Fredo was taking over Palm and that he was going to be campus pastor there, I was like, wait, I know that campus. Yeah. Like, I know that church. <laughs> yeah, it was cool being able to 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 serve as a pastor um, at, at Palm Avenue, man. It was, it was a treat. So, because mm -hmm. there's so much history. I think it was planted in the 40s or 50s in Riverside. I should remember this date. It's really? Better. I don't remember that. Yeah. Wow. Um, Dave will do a quick fact check on that. But yes. Yeah, Palm Baptist Church in Riverside. And um, so many people, yeah, came through that church, were discipled in that church. And so um, the previous pastor, Albert Shade, stayed on our staff for a number of years. Mm. Such a gift of a man, mm. Native American, who came to faith in Jesus. And uh, yeah, was a, just had a heart for people, man. A great, great, great mm. guy to just learn a lot from. So... Yeah, really cool. Kids we, loved it. Ash enjoyed it there. It was it was a treat, man. The uh, yeah, you get the small church experience within the large church. Yeah, pretty yeah. no amazing. Um, you know, with with all the change that's happened, I mean, you've you've been in Sandals for quite a while now, and you guys have been able to um, yeah hurdle the pandemic and all that happened there, and continue to grow and flourish and minister to a lot of people. And you also see the change in, um, I don't know, just what's happening in our culture, what's happening in our world and yeah. the church trying to adapt and to continue to minister in the midst of a cha rapidly changing culture. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like when you reflect on all of that, um, things that, uh, that you see the culture doing or the direction you see it going. I mean, even we were talking about a little bit before digitally, you know, really mm -hmm. reaching into the space and trying to minister and... Um, you're, you're getting to do a lot of that on the, uh, on the front end of your ministry. Yeah, it's great, man. It's, it's a really unique opportunity to try to figure out, you know, what are the, what are the, uh, what are the gospels that are out in the world today, out in the culture today? You know, what are the good news stories that they believe in mm. and then figure out how to create common ground out of that and then bring it back to the actual good news, you know, mm. the only good news that's worth giving your life to, you know? So I think about like where all the rom-coms go. Mm. Like where all the romantic comedies, you know, right. everyone says we're living in the nineties right now, but I don't see the romantic comedies of the nineties anymore. Right, right. And I think it's because our heart, like our desires have changed for like self-discovery, right? Like that's kind of the new thing now today. Mm. And so it's like, all right, well, how do we figure out like the good parts of being an individual, but then actually connect that back to Jesus saying, like, if you actually want to know who you are, like die to yourself, follow mm. me. And, and you get to discover that, you know what I mean? You'll discover real life. And so, Part of part of being on the the digital media side of things is figuring out yeah how to um, offer story offer content in a way that like is uh, somewhat compelling and kind of catches people on their phone mm. you know at all hours of the day mm -hmm. you know so that's it's a new space to be in but digital discipleship is a very real thing right mm. like we are all being formed by our devices by the totally. amount of time on our devices and totally. so we want to try to redeem the tool as best we can for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's been fun to kind of explore that a little mm -hmm. bit. So yeah, if you don't disciple your kids, someone else will. Oh, for sure. It's, it, yeah. it will, it is happening. Yeah. Cause discipleship, like you just said right now, it's not a religious thing. It's a human thing. Mm -hmm. Like everyone is a disciple of someone or something mm -hmm. and whatever will, you know, whoever your rabbi is very much dictates the kind of life you live, you know? And so our offer is the rabbi Jesus is pretty legit. Yes. And like, we think he's worth following, yes. you know, um, and not just thinking about, you know, he'll save you so that when you die, uh, you'll go to heaven. But like, if you were to wake up tomorrow, here's how to live life like him, mm -hmm. you know, here's how to experience the fullness of life, the abundant life, you know. And so that's been, that's been exciting to kind of use platforms today to try to help make that message make sense in our, in our current, current moment, you know, so especially where self-discovery is mm -hmm. so big, bro. Self-actualization, mm. you know, you can do this. Like, I think there's something to be said. Like we love watching people, you know, uh, transform their bodies through working out or right. like uh, making the right investments or whatever, like their thing is like that's helped build their platform. You know, there's something exciting about that, but 
I think the dangerous side of self-optimization is like you can't save yourself. Mm. You know, like you're always going to fall short. Yes. Um, and so there's there's good news though on the end of that. Like Amen. you you can't. You know, but someone else el- like actually can, and they mm. did. And here's how you can know him. You know, and mm-hmm. so there's a unique offer I think of of trying to bring the gospel in a in a world of self-discovery mm-hmm. and individualism. You know, so one thing I've always loved about you, Fredo, is that you have this ability to. You have the, the ability to connect the gospel to story, mm. stories of real time and stories of our culture. And yeah. I don't know how you, your eyes, your eyes uh, have a filter of gospel on them. And it's almost like you're <laughs> looking for gospel everywhere. Yeah. And you're looking for it in movies and TV shows and stories in society. And yeah, I love going on. That, man. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's impacted your ministry and your teaching. And um, where did that come from? Like, Man, I don't, I don't know, bro. I just well, you're, you, so uh, I, I'm trying to analyze Fredo from the outside, but you're <laughs> you're a Star Wars guy. Yeah, yeah. So and um, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, big Lord of the Rings. Read the books. So love the adventure. The movies, love yeah. the adventure. Love the um, and 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 Star Wars. But did film impact your life when you were young, or story impact your life when you were young? Yeah. So I always watched movies, especially with my dad. So I have vivid memories being young and he, like Saturdays, he would take us to Best Buy yeah. and we'd buy these things called DVDs. <laughs> and for on the right day, bro, you can yeah. get for 1999, bro, you get the double disc feature right? and the second disc had all the behind the scenes. So yeah, I think at just a young age, film was like a great escape for me, like to just dive into a story, dive into a world. And I think, so. I mean, human beings, we're the only storytelling animals. Like, monkeys don't write stories about themselves. You know what I mean? Like, so human beings are uniquely wired to be storytellers, to help us make sense of who we are, how the world works. And that's because a storyteller created all of this, right? Like, God himself is a storyteller. Yes. Which is why we have scripture. And so I think there's just something innate about us as people. We long to be in stories. And we kind of eventually start to live in the stories we tell ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So whatever you're most shaped by, by film, shows, all those things, that starts to shape the kind of person you live out in reality. And Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I think first coming across the works of like C.S. Lewis and other thinkers like that, Tolkien, like they they just sparked my curiosity around, dang, you can communicate the gospel through... Mm -hmm like very non-religious ways, mm. you know, through through film. Um, and so oftentimes you'll meet someone who maybe like thinks this idea that Jesus would have to die to forgive us sounds so archaic mm. and like tribal sure. and violent. But then you watch a film on sacrifice where someone else like substitutes themselves so that everyone else can live. Mm. Like uh, Harry Potter, the boy who's come to die, <laughs> you know, mm. like you realize, oh, shoot. That's sacrificial love. Like right. that's a God, that's all over the scriptures, right. you know? Uh, and then you come to find out like the author of the Potter series is actually like a Christian. Like wow. you just, you, you realize like all the things that they're all in the world, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And so, yeah, I think I just, um, once I became a Christian, there was just like a redemptive element of like, I just had to look for it in every mm-hmm. story, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Even if it ended up like I sound corny at some point, but it's hard not to see it. No, I know? love it it's though. It's hard not to find it and be like, moved by certain things in yes. film, you know, um, even in romantic comedies, like these people have to sacrifice something in order to have the love they want, mm. you know, like, well, that's covenant, you know? So there's always like something that you're looking for mm-hmm. that I think um, helps us make sense of our lives, but then also connects us to some biblical truth that maybe the greater culture doesn't want to receive from you mm. on a Sunday in the pulpit, but like the show they're watching is telling it to them, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to kind of try to find that. So well, to have a gospel lens like that, I mean, it's like permanently on, you know, on Fredo, like he, he's able to see it everywhere. And I remember you like pointing these things out to me from time to time over the years, but like, dude, did you see, you see the gospel in there, you know, it's yeah. like sitting right there in that story. I'm like, and I'm like, well, huh? Like, what? I'm trying, I'm trying, I kind of get, what? No, I'm trying to process. And, uh, but I see it a lot more now. And um, I don't know, it, it, it took my, my mind and my heart a bit of time to catch up, but I can see through this gospel lens and this story and this overarching story that God is ultimately doing on the earth, like mm-hmm. you see it through all kinds of mm-hmm. things. And I think one of the most, um, I mean, it's a bit more obvious, but one of the most impactful moments of where I could see the gospel, which it wasn't overtly being said, but it definitely leans in that direction was Les Miserables. And uh, no joke, we're, we were on our honeymoon, uh, me and Katie, and uh, 
I remember I had never seen the film. I had never watched the play. I'd never seen anything. Somebody was like, you got to see this case. Like it's one of the best, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm watching it. I had been studying, you know, like Romans five to, you know, eight, basically at that time, Romans five, six, seven, eight, oh, yeah. like the package gospel, like right there. And, um, I remember as I was watching, so Katie had fallen asleep. We're like in some hotel, you know, in, in, uh, where we were staying. And, um, and anyways, uh, I'm watching the thing by myself on the iPad. I'm just sitting there and I'm no joke, Fredo. I'm just like, start crying, dude. Oh, I'm just like, man. I'm like, oh my gosh, I see, I see Jesus. I see the law, dude. I see the law pursuing me. I see yeah. grace being poured. Like I see, like, I just, mm. It all started like, you know what I mean? Like the scales is falling and I'm just like moved and like broken, like over the gospel through this film. And I'm just like, how is this hidden in there? The name of Jesus isn't said one time in the entire film, but somehow it's like messing me up, you know, yeah. spiritually uh, with the good news. And um, oh, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. And I, 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 I wish we would see more of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what's um, kind of a new era for us is try to, how, how do we recover creativity? Mm. Not just that's like overtly Christian, but like still thoughtful and nuanced yes. and, and offers offers genuine hope, but like in a way that's not forced, mm -hmm. you know? I mm -hmm. think that's the challenge for any filmmaker, but particularly ones who are Christian is like, how do I tell a story or write a novel that's mm -hmm. a compelling one that maybe doesn't force it? Like, oh, Jesus at the end is the answer, you right. know? But like right. leads them down a, a path that kind of exposes them or forces them to reconcile like, okay, these are my options, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and sometimes you can do it overtly and it's like really clear. Other times it could be a bit more subtle that like kind of leaves people thinking, mm -hmm. you know? So. But yeah, they're, they're powerful images. And they all come from Jesus. I mean, Jesus told parables constantly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to to a people that wouldn't have been all well read. You know what I mean? So mainly the rabbis read at the time. And so you wouldn't you wouldn't have everyday people out in the like, sh like fields, like knowing how to read texts, you know? Right. So stories was how he communicated mm. truth. So mm. there's something to learn from that. Yeah. You know? And often his stories didn't have a command. Mm. Like the first are last and the last are first. There's no command in that. Mm. That's just like a visual story of how life goes mm. in the kingdom of God. Mm. So it's up to you to kind of work through that, mm. you know, and solve that for yourself. Then, okay, if that's true, then how does my life then change because of that truth, mm. you know? And so I think sometimes, that's where I think some Christian art goes awry is like, we try to give you the command, mm. you know, versus just here, let's give you a picture of God's kingdom. Mm. And then, and then let you wrestle with that. Let you like, let you like navigate that a little mm. bit, you know? So yeah, we love to plaster the letter of the law yeah, instead of declaring the spirit of the law. Right. Right. And let the spirit of the law have its way. Yeah. Dude, that's, that's exactly it, man. That's exactly it. So, and that's, I mean, honestly, in my own pastoral work right now, I, I feel like I'm having this epiphany, Josh, where I think of the words of Jesus in tw Matthew 28, all authority under heaven and on earth is like, I have all authority. Go and make disciples, right? Teaching them to obey everything I've said and done. But then uh, baptizing in the name of the Father. I don't want to mess up the verse for everyone who's listening. He's like, oh, he doesn't know the verse. Sure. But uh, I, here's the epiphany. I can tell people what Jesus has said, but I don't know if I've been good at helping them to understand how to obey it. Mm. Right? I can tell you his ethic on generosity, his ethic on sexuality, holiness, all those other things. Mm. But the how, I think, is the is the challenge. And so I've recently had this epiphany of like, man, I think some of the pastoral work that's coming down the road is the how. Mm. And I come back to that because I think about those early years. Good. We were like a family all living together, trying to work out the how. Right. You know what I mean? Like we, we understood what the Bible was saying enough to like help us continue to grow. Right. But the part of community was helping us to understand like the how, mm -hmm. you know? Because um, it's one thing to tell a young adult, here's Jesus's sexual ethic on your singleness right. and how you should conduct your body. It's another thing to hear them tell you, well, they're trying to break out of sexual sin and not look at porn anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like, how do I help them understand the application of the command right. that your body is a temple? Right. You know, other than just, instead of just reiterating, don't do those things. Right. How? Right. Like, how do we help someone grow in holiness over the years? You right. know, and so I think that's where a lot of pastoral work is yet to be done because... Mm -hmm. Christian content is just everywhere and anywhere you want to go, you can find it. Right. But I think um, content that helps people in the how that shapes them is, I think, is work that's still yet to be done. You know, right. the the, so. the the law basic the law misses the person oftentimes, right? The law yeah. just declares the blanket statement for all, and right. then 
trying to figure out what that looks like in real time for your own life uh, applies in so many different ways. The application, the truth is the same. It's very clear. It's crystal clear. Yeah. But the application of that truth seems to translate in a lot of different ways into people's lives. And you do have youth asking, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how? Yeah. What is Teaching them like? what versus how. Those are two different things, you mm -hmm. know? And I'm sure you sense that too, as you're preaching and pastoring people, like, how does this land? Mm. How, how is this, you know, going to make sense in their Monday through Sunday mm -hmm. lives? You know, that's, that's the great challenge. So I well, definitely sense that with, um, I'd love to hear your take on Gen Z, you know, the next generation, what's happening. And yeah. you definitely see a, you see a generation who doesn't want to be married. You know, you see a generation who uh, doesn't have a lot of dads, um, mm you know, you see a generation who is kind of like wandering and they just like, you know, if they haven't made it by the time they're 21, you know, and they're, they're so angry with life, you know, and, yeah. um, um, trying to, yeah, I guess trying to decipher, you know, like how do we, uh, help these kids, you know, how do we, isn't that crazy? We're even talking mm -hmm. in this language because it's like, I'm 41 now, dude, I'm getting yeah, old. I'm 37, right? you know, but it's like, these kids, these kids look at me and think I'm old, you know, can you believe this? They I think know, I'm old, man. you know, know. Um, but they are looking for fathers, you know, they're looking yeah. for spiritual leadership and they, they want to be discipled and they want to be told. And I think, um, yeah, you know, I, 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 I see a lot of, um, hmm, a lot of the church stepping back instead of stepping into, uh, trying to reach them and meet yeah. them where they're at. And uh, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. You know, I don't exactly know what it looks like, but I don't know. I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah, man. A lot of thoughts. I feel like at first, anytime the church is confronted with a different generation, there's a temptation just to revert back to previous methods. Mm. Like, oh, let's just go back to mm. this old program that right. worked and revitalized in like Gen X or right. Boomers, you know. Right. But I, what's unique about Gen Z that's even different from like my millennial generation is a lot of us are deconstructing like my age group, right? Right. Is we're like pulling off doctrines. Some of them need to come off because right. they're like not inherently scriptural. They're just mm. kind of like sub subcultural mm. ideas. Legalistic you know? or yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think just like we're both deconstructing, but also reconstructing. That's mm. the point, you mm. know, is that you would go back to the foundation and then rebuild from there. Mm. Mm. But I think with Gen Z, they're not deconstructing. They don't have anything to deconstruct. They're very non-religious, right? right. But they are multi. They're they're very multicultural. Uh, they're very diverse, right? So there's actually elements in Gen Z that I think is very family oriented, mm. even though they are very individualistic. But they long for a community, mm. and so I think Jesus's radical idea of family, like when he says, "Who is my mother?" or "Who are my brothers?" Mm. when he's asked, like you know, in the middle of a lecture, "Hey, Jesus, your mom's looking for you." Mm. Like, "Who is my mother?" Now he's saying that in a culture where familial bond was everything, right? right? There was no like higher loyalty. In fact, you'd be punished for like going against your family, mm. you know what I mean? And so, which is why you see Herod divorcing his wife, killing his wife, because he's protecting a, a family member, you mm. know, um, and other cases like that, because uh, familial bond was everything. And so Jesus' radical idea of family, that he's creating a new family mm. um, that is incredibly diverse, pulls from all different generations. I think that is actually a way in with Gen Z, because they're not necessarily deconstructing, they're rebuilding something, but they're kind of pulling together a lot of different stuff. You know, the digital world has made everyone a lot closer, which is why like we all dress the same, we talk the same, our houses all look the same, you know, because mm -hmm. we can go into anyone's living room and design our own bathroom mm -hmm. now or whatever space is. And so there's kind of like a closeness that's happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just us pulling together whatever we want to believe in and become. And so I think offering his vision of family is, is a unique approach in for them, you know, mm. that I think could be immensely helpful um, and, and compelling beyond just their individual desires because the self-discovery gospel is a strong one today. Mm. Like reach deep down inside, pull out your biggest desire and live that out. You know, the only problem with that is I got a million desires, right? right? Like I wake up today, I have a desire to be in shape, so I want to work out. Right. But I also have a desire to sleep, so I sleep in. Right. I have a desire to be a good husband to Ashley right. and father. So I, I, you open the hood of my life, and I got a thousand desires. Which one is the truest one? Right. right. Well, the truest thing about me is that I'm the beloved of God in Christ. And so I got to allow that desire to be cultivated, protected, mm. and to kind of inform everything else. You know. And so I think helping this new generation understand 
you're more than just your desire for pleasure. Mm. You're more than just your desire for stuff. And you're more than just your desire to be known by other people. Mm. You know, there's a deeper part of your soul that needs to be secure in the maker, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and by the way, he's got a family that he's forming, you know? So I think their, their desire for community, protection, justice, all of those things that Jesus actually gives better answers for mm. are like a healthy way for us to, I think, connect with the next generation, you know? So, because there is a gospel out there that says like, we should be better people and society should be better. Mm. You know, the gospel of justice and all those things, but it's only through Jesus that you can actually make that possible, mm -hmm. you know, because he's both the judge and the justifier, right? And so justice from his perspective is a better way forward, I think, mm. you know. Um, his vision of family includes people that you like and don't like, right? Mm. That's a much broader view. So I think there's just things that he offers that uniquely speak to Gen Z that maybe we can pick up on in, in our teaching and our pastoring and our conversations with neighbors, you know, that, that maybe offers, their, offers them something to consider, you know. When you, so. when you um, social media, you know, in the, uh, the new frontier. Yeah. Um, do you think Jesus and the apostle Paul would have, you know, TikTok and, you know, um, you know what I mean? Like, like, I mean, it's, that's a joke off the cuff. But yeah. It's like, it's funny, not funny, you know, it's like, um, you know, the, the next generation is going to be there. They are there. Yeah. And I don't know if- Their whole life is lived online, essentially. I don't know if they'll rebel against it in like 10 years, you know, or they'll just be like, forget this, you know, like I, I want to, yeah. I want to become ancient, you know, I want to, I want to get back to small time. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do, but trying to navigate this has been um, difficult. It's both, uh, you know, fun on one end and, and uh, a monster that you have to continue to feed, you know, yeah. that just bothers me. I mean, on the other end, and it's like, um, it's weird that if you delete yourself from uh, the internet and social media, like it's almost like you don't exist. Right, right. right. Um, I don't know, how, how have you, you know, I'm sure you've thought through it quite a bit, you know, how have you navigated this or what, what do you think Christ is calling us to do in these spaces? And how, how do we navigate or find the balance in this or, you know, yeah, how have yeah. you? Know, Shoot, man, part of me hopes that for my kids, because they're nine and five, that like by the time they grow up, social media would have like imploded at that point. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I have a strange hope that yes. happens. But then I also strangely feel like it's not going anywhere, you right. know. So I think trying to give myself to practices that help recover a sense of who I am apart from my platform or who I am online is really helpful, you know. So I think Jesus offers us practices like solitude and silence and the Sabbath so we can disconnect from who we are professionally and, and kind of who we project ourselves out to be, you know? Um, and then I think about like obscurity, like the man Jesus lived 30 years away from the public eye. And you think like, if God is in the business of rescuing the world, like he's got to get to it, like chop, chop God, you know, but like he allowed Jesus to be born as a baby mm. to grow in an ordinary non-sexy place like Jerusalem mm. and Nazareth and Bethlehem. Like, so he just allowed normal life to happen, but in very obscure places, like he was away from the limelight, mm. you know? And so, and I think in his life, you see a rhythm of he knows how to get away with God in prayer, and then he knows how to go and be with people, but neither one take from each other. Mm. You know, there's like this tension he almost lives in where he knows when it's time to be with people, to be public, but he also knows when it's time to be private, to live a life of integrity before God, you know? And so um, I think there's something about obscurity that maybe we can recover for our own sake mm. and then offer that kind of to the next generation. Like, mm -hmm. is there anything sacred and private about your life that you don't share with anyone? Mm. That's like just beautiful and mm -hmm. you just do it, you know, like the scripture says, you don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, mm -hmm. right? Like, so maybe you do good things and you don't tell anyone about mm -hmm. it, you know, and it just kind of is something you do on yeah. the side. Like, so I, I, I feel like the human soul longs for that. and. Mm -hmm. Maybe over time we'll see a recovery of that where people are not as digitally connected, you know, or long to be, and mm -hmm. they do have a better balance. Or I don't even know if balance is the right word, but they just have a better relationship to their phones right. and um, their screens and, and who they are online, you know. So, because clearly we see the ramifications already. I think it's still yet to be told, but like people are more socially anxious, mm. you know, around each other. We It's hard for us to have relationships with one another. Like yep. the siloing of our world is a sad reality, right. you know, and it's having ramifications. And in large part, 
I think social media has impacted that, you know. And so I think discipling people in the way of Jesus can help recover it, again, for our own sake, our own churches, mm -hmm. but then also for our next generation, you know. And so, because, yeah, it's, it's tough, man. We want to give our kids access to things, but like yeah. we also want to be very careful, you know, because it's helpful at dinner when I'm just trying to have a conversation with right. someone, like, right. watch this, you know, but right. then, like, when they know YouTubers' names and all this stuff, like, it's just, it's just bananas, right. bro. Like, right. I'm like, where did you hear that? Right. You know, so it's, it's, it's a trip, man. It's a trip to navigate it. So, because my son's already asking, like, Dad, when am I going to get a phone? I'm like, I don't know, when you're 21 or something? Like, <laughs> you know, we're going to give you, you a dumb phone, phone then, you know? <laughs> but I realize I sound like I'm that parent I who's know, like, nah, dude, you're, you're good right now. Yeah, like, if you yeah, want, you know, yeah. you want to watch something, you're we'll free. watch it together. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's a trip, man. It's yeah. a trip. It feels like it's an everyday thing, just with my wife and I, with Ashley trying to discover what it is that we're going to do with them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how to disciple them out of that. So, yeah. but I don't know. You know, I don't know. I just don't know. You know, I, I, I both love it. It's a love hate relationship and yeah, I hate for it. Sure. You know? And for I, sure. um, I know it is the portal, uh, to the entire world. And sometimes I don't want access to the whole world. Yeah. You know, sometimes like you said it well, your soul craves that solitude. Your soul craves doing things in the secret, which no one else knows about. That's actually yeah. good unto God and good unto the other people. Yeah. You know, only, only your small group of people, you know, your friends or your tribe, like no, your little hometown, you know, is, mm -hmm. um, there was, uh, I've been I've said this on the other podcast, but I've been watching, uh, this, uh, this show called blue zones. Blue zones. Okay. Blue zones are um, where centurions live or people who live to be over a hundred years old. There are these wow. blue, blue zones on the earth. And one of them is Sardinia and uh, Italy. And uh, they talked to these men and, and she said, one of the major factors of these, these men who live to be over a hundred is, is their occupation. They're like, what's well, the number one occupation that centurions live in Sardinia? Shepherds. No way. Shepherds. Yeah. Wow. And then, uh, she says, um, one of the things that we looked at when studying these men is that they, um, what social media has done is given you access to all bad news that happens on the earth constantly. So mm. you're never meant to have this much uh, stress and chaos, like show up at your fingertips and in your eyes, you're only supposed to be given uh, the amount of stress in one day that you can actually manage and solve. Right. And these old men, uh, right. their biggest stress factor is taking care of that one sheep who's like going over there doing that. And so <laughs> they just go take care of that sheep. That's their stress for the day and wow. they take care of it and move on their way. And of course, you know, just like, Lord, you know, like, you, you know, hey, help me, you know, because it, it's, it's a double-edged sword and yeah. Um, yeah, our kids are, are going to be drawn to it and I, I need to know enough about it to help navigate it, but I don't want to be overtaken by it that I'm, um, I don't have real relationships anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, the next generation feels like they don't, uh, I don't know if I'm assessing this correctly, but it seems like a lot of kids don't know how to uh, socially interact, you know, they don't know how to, oh, 1, you know, they, 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 they're nervous to just stand in front of a, another person and have a conversation and yeah. men don't know how to approach a girl anymore, you know, and it's, it's yeah. sliding the DMs. Of course, it's the only way to approach yeah, a girl, right? Dude. You know, it's, I tell you, Ashley all the time, I couldn't imagine, yeah. I could, I would not make it, bro. <laughs> I would right. be by myself forever. Right. And I don't say that like, you know, with a sense of demise or despair for this generation, but it seems so hard. Mm -hmm. For the for yeah people today to date to get to know each other you know that's probably why I'm grateful for the community we had because that's that's how I found Ash like yes. I found Ash through my friend Donovan who was also at the church you know right. so like man I I can't yeah I I have the blessings I'm walking in right now because like people were praying for him years ago mm -hmm. you know and um, we love our life together but yeah we I th we think back often like I would have never made it mm -hmm. so sometimes we'll play a game like hey why don't you like come up to me like for the first time. <laughs> You ever do this with Katie at all? No. Dude, yeah, so be like, if you saw me here, what, like, what would you say? What would be your first, like, what's like your pickup this. line? I like this. It's terrible, bro. I got no game. I'm like, hey, your hair looks good. You know, or something like, it's so, right. I have zero hope. Yeah, yeah. Zero hope, yeah. you know. But you're right, yeah, I think there's, like, we're, we're becoming a bit more dehumanized. You said it a second ago, like, we weren't meant to take in the amount of information we do, you know, and... 
it's this incredible tool. You, you called it a portal to the world. It's so true. But then also at the same time, we should be asking ourselves, am I designed to take in this much today? You know, what's this doing to my brain? What's it doing to my body, my neuro, my neural system, my mm-hmm. soul, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I'm hoping at some point through, yeah, through gospel witness, through just general society and sociology, like people will come to a place where they're like, we got to, we got to put a pause on this, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but same thing with cigarettes and other things. Like it took decades before the ramifications were fully seen. You right. know? And so I feel like we'll probably be really old before we finally get like the data. Here's right. everything that happened because right. of the iPhone. Right. You know? Right. So, but it's a trip, man. It's a, it's such a, 2007 is a staple time. Like that's when the iPhone came out. That's wow. when I became a Christian, you know? Wow. So like 07 was a, a big, big year. So Lakers were terrible that year. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so it was an interesting time. You've been married 12 years. Yeah. And um, I don't know, you know, as you reflect back on the decade of marriage, um, I like to tell the brothers we're one quarter in. Yeah, dude. You know, we, we made it That's first good. quarter. Uh, we haven't, we're not even close to halftime yet. Yeah. Um, but when you reflect back on it, I don't know, any, any things that have been just life-giving to you and Ashley, things that have refreshed uh, your relationship, things, you know, over the years that you guys return back to, or you think is just really just given life over and over again through, again, uh, married, married with no kids, married with kids, married with young kids, young yeah. family. Uh, now your, your kids, um, elementary and, uh, yeah, you know, all of, all of that season. Yeah. I constantly think about like our friendship. Mm. We just have, we have such a rich friendship. Um, we started as friends, mm. you know, we were all kind of in the same large Christian circle at that mm-hmm. time. And so before we dated, cause I asked her out on her 18th birthday. I'm wow. Like, let's, let's date, you know, made it official. You're legal. Let's make it official. Yes. Nice. <laughs> but uh, we were friends before that, you know, and yeah. like, I think that's been a through line in our relationship over the last 12 years is we've protected the friendship. Um, I know it's something you talk about when you officiate weddings, mm-hmm. right? You talk about, I don't know if it's one of your Fs, you got these little alliterations, you yes. know, but we, we try to protect our friendship, man. We try to protect our face-to-face time with each other, whether it's through dating or conversations on the couch, you know? Um, and so I, I feel like that's been a recent journey. I think also coming to the realization, and this one's probably like more of a sobering one, is like part of marriage is learning to not just love your spouse for who they are, but for who they're not. Mm. And I, by that, I mean like sometimes you drive yourself crazy thinking we're having the same conversation again that we had like six years ago and it's like humbling like dang fredo i'm not sometimes that much different than i was years ago like it's humbling you know but i think ashley's depth of love and commitment has grown out of her loving not just who i am but who i'm also not yet Mm. you know Mm. and the same and so i think having that just be named for what it is Mm -hmm. Having other couples around you that can encourage you in that journey mm-hmm. is really, really helpful. Because the sad reality is that you and I both know people who have hit this year and it's done. Right. Right. Like I was, I was speaking to young adults last week at our church saying, a lot of you are in the season of getting married or looking for your spouse. I'm in the season now of talking to people who are no longer spouses. Right. Like that's yeah. just the reality of yes. life. Yeah. Because the disappointment of that person has been too great for them. Mm. More than enough of them saying like, I'm either going to continue with this disappointment and stay or I'm going to leave. Mm. And many people just leave, you know? And so I think us embracing friendship, going back to the same things, Mm -hmm. seeing God's grace be deeper than those things, be Mm -hmm. deeper than those habits, be deeper than those quirks, you know? Um, And just just sharing a bit more. Unfortunately, in my early teaching days, I was a great teacher, but I was a terrible husband. Mm -hmm. And so the students loved me, but I was um, tired when I came home. Mm -hmm. I I didn't care for Ash well, you Mm -hmm. know? We had Eli pretty young and surprising. And so she, she was pretty alone in a lot of those years. Mm-hmm. And that was a, a challenge, I think, mm-hmm. you know? And so part of me in the later season has been learning from that mm-hmm. and figuring out how to be a more present husband, mm-hmm. you know, and actually model Jesus in the home and not just professionally for what I do. Yes. Um, and that that's integrity, right? That's the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness. Like you're the same everywhere, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think that's been uh, the recent journey of like protecting that well in our relationship, mm-hmm. you know? And so, uh, yeah, I think that was, that's kind of what we where we've been, and we have a lot of fun together, man. We, yes, we we love life, and so we we try to soak that in too. So no, I love the, well, I, praise God for social media in that aspect. <laughs> I love the posts. I love the the fun you guys are having. You guys inspire, you know, from a distance because it's cool. like you know, 
I keep telling Katie this too. I mean, like, you know, we're as young as we're ever going to be, you know, like let's, I think <laughs> it's, it's the th I think it's the third and greatest commandment. Love God, love <laughs> one another and get on enjoying life. You know, <laughs> yeah. like you got it, you know, he had the oil of gladness, you know, dumped upon his head. He, mm. he, he was full of joy, no mm. doubt for the fruit of the spirit is joy. And he beamed that everywhere he went and he had a blast. And it's, it's, uh, sometimes in ministry, it's easy to, you know, get uh, the, the stress, you know, and the, the burdens yeah. that we carry and the, um, and this life and in the, these last, you know, four years, you know, in Southern California, and it's so easy to get, um, just so caught up in the reality of all that's happening and just allow joy to be stripped, you know, and, yeah. um, anxiety to be put on and yeah. uh, stress to be put on and starts to um, corrode the friendship. Mm -hmm. we, we stop talking, we stop communicating, we start folding in. Mm -hmm. I love that you pointed that out, friendship, you know, that's what marriage is, it's just a friendship in the end. Uh, yeah. Two friends who just so happen to be romantic about each other, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that they're, uh, the conversation has started and it's just continuing on. And um, yeah, you know, I, I um, you, you know, you said in the beginning when you were teaching, I was reflecting on my own and just feeling tired and overwhelmed. I, an epiphany that came upon me, even when I do pre-marriage now or I do weddings now, you know, I have something that often comes back to me is there was a time, I don't know, somewhere around year five or six, where I think I literally, the lights turned on and I realized like I was not listening like to my friend, like I heard, mm. I heard everything she said. Mm. I wasn't listening to anything, you know? Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't listen between the lines, you know, to my friend and try to understand what she was meaning and what she was getting at. And it is, uh, it's been a journey, you know, but by God's grace, you know, we are, we are still here. And, uh, I love, I love the, when I, we just got to do a little vacation, one of my favorite times of that vacation was nice. just being able to talk late at night, like being able to talk. The, because we were in the hotel, the uh, the kids were asleep in the hotel. You can't watch the TV in there. Everything's out. There's like a little balcony in there and we just sit there and just talk for like an hour That's and a half. Best, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. just nothing but just, just being together Yeah. and eating our chocolate and just hanging. I mean, it's just the best. Yeah. And um I don't know. I'm looking forward to that, you know, continuing to to build that friendship, build that marriage and to keep on having fun. Yeah. Keep on yeah, having man. fun. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Um, maybe we'll wind this thing down and go get some lunch, huh? Let's do it, man. Uh, I'd love to ask you this final question though, sure. before um, you are a booksmith, you're a wordsmith, you, um, any books that have just impacted you forever or books as of recent that just like, absolute must read like really i love 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 you know these are life impactful maybe these are like ones that i'm really enjoying yeah um i'll give you a few in different categories okay. so for like the academics listening um i love and obviously his theology has shaped a lot of christian thinking augustine's confessions mm. one of my favorite lines in there is you, you can't be close to god and far from yourself Mm. It's a great, great line. In other words, like you got to know who you are. And part of knowing who you are is knowing who God is. Mm. I come back to that thought often, mm. you know. Um, in recent days, I've been loving Ronald Rollheiser's book, Sacred Fire. Mm. It's a book essentially on what it's like to follow Jesus right now in like your midlife. Mm. Like it's a, and I, it's even crazy to say midlife, like I'm 37, but right. like we're at the halfway point, right. you know, unless we find a blue zone. Right, right. <laughs> Live to 110 or 115, right. Right, but right, like right. we're right there, man. So his wisdom on just the understanding the stages of life has been so, so helpful. So I'm reading it slow. I go back and read some of the same chapters, but Ronald Rollheiser, he's actually, I think he's a Catholic, mm. but I mean, incredibly Orthodox mm. and just rich insight on what it's like to follow Jesus in the middle of your life. Mm. And I feel like he's like reading my mail, man. When he describes certain things, I feel like, dang, this is where I'm at. This is, is this a I'm new sensing. book? Is it a new book? No, it's been it? out for years. Man. Really? Yeah. Called Sacred Fire. And he does a great job of understanding what it's like in your young life, your midlife, and then how you prepare to die, like how you prepare to end well and mm -hmm. give away your life, you know? And so it, it's just, it's so rich, man. Mm -hmm. So pastoral, but so down to earth. That one's been immensely helpful. Um, as a pastor, I've also been reading Henry Nouwen's book. It's a short little book on Christian leadership called In the Name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I'm just in the first section on um, choosing prayer over relevance. Mm -hmm. And it feels like such a timely word in our world right now. Mm -hmm. That's been uh, that's been immensely helpful. Um, Tim Keller's work over the years has mm -hmm. been so good for me, mm -hmm. and 
Yeah, that's that's just to name a few. I really have enjoyed Malcolm Gladwell's stuff. He's an American writer. Mm. I read his book, The Bomb, The Bomber Mafia, on a plane recently. I was on my way to Australia, and um, it's about this, like these bombers during World War II, and it's it's about all the history that led up to the atomic bomb, mm. and the kind of decision making that was going into, uh, like, do we either just bomb to annihilate everyone, or do we bomb strategically with tools, mm. like over factories? and like water tanks and things like that, that would essentially eliminate an army, right? And unfortunately, it's about how we try to use the best of our tools, but they, they bring out the worst of us, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's one of his like opening lines mm-hmm. is, the best intentions will always be overruled by the kind of technology we have, you know? And so it's like a, like a cautionary tale of all the events that led up to the atomic bomb and the people involved. But um, Malcolm Gladwell's a, such a great writer, man, who's actually, he's a Christian and he came back to his faith. He talks wow. about that in some of his other works, but yeah, man, Talking to Strangers is another great one of his. Outliers is kind of like his well-known book, mm. but yeah, check out Malcolm Gladwell. Um, yeah, those are some ones that come to my mind. So I'll, I'll probably think of 10 after this. Right. Over lunch, I'll be like, of course. dang it, yeah, this yeah. is another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a few. You know, Where, and of course, the Holy Bible. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the words of Christ. The words of Jesus. Red everybody. letters. Yes, yeah. a great reference. Yeah. <laughs> um, where can people find you online? Yeah, so if you want to connect with me, I'm on Instagram, Fredo Ramos, I think is my name. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not that, mm-hmm. that yeah, well-versed. Yeah, Fredo Ramos, yeah. Yeah, Fredo Ramos is where you can find me. Uh, if you look up Sandals Church on YouTube, sandalschurch.tv is where we mm-hmm. produce a lot of content. You can find some of my stuff there. Um, but yeah, I'd love, love to connect with anyone. You go, visit, man, you go visit him in uh, Riverside. Yeah, if yeah. If you're door. near one of our Sandals Church locations, man, come through. I'm primarily at Hunter Park in Riverside. Um, but yeah, I would love to love to meet anyone. So, Love you, brother. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. I really Thanks, appreciate bro. it. Thanks for having uh, me, man. Your, uh, yeah, you're impacting still from a distance, you know. I, uh, I'm, I'm blessed by the brothers. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed by you. Um, thank you for all the years, man, just continuing to pour out and surrender life to Jesus and build up people and strengthen in him. And uh, you guys are, you're leading with a great example. I'm thankful for you. Thanks, bro. And uh, dude, so stoked to have you on the show. Yeah, it was a gift, bro. Come thank on you, again man. sometime. Thank you. All right, let's get some lunch. Let's eat. <laughs>